Yeah, everybody good? Yeah. Uh, any jet lags here? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, if you're just sitting here watching, it's fine, but just a warning. I was looking at my slides last night. I had no idea what I was looking at. So, <laughs> let's see how it goes. I will wait until it's, it's one o'clock. I'm a little OCD. Just a little bit. Is it, is it, was that a countdown? Was that a countdown to one o'clock? No? Oh, it's one o'clock. Hi. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, um, to my presentation, my talk, Fast Content Creation with Code and Creativity. Now, you might be asking, what does it mean? Um, different interpretations. Uh, the most obvious one is to use code or Python for very mundane tasks so you have more time for your art or for your content creation. Um, when you do 3D, there are a lot of like very mundane tasks, just pressing buttons that have no artistic value whatsoever, yet they take a lot of time. Um, there's another interpretation uh, for this, which I kind of like. Um, use creative out-of-the-box thinking to design and write a personalized pipeline with tools. Now, the keyword is personalized, so it's catered to your needs. And sometimes it could be catered to a specific project, which also makes it kind of personalized. Um, both scenarios, we're talking about efficiency. We're trying to make things run as efficient as possible so you can save time for, for the more artistic things. Um, what I like about the uh, creative out-of-the-box thinking kind of alludes to the idea that you can do whatever you want. Uh, the limitations is just, okay, how much can you do with, let's say, Python or code? Uh, and Blender offers you this, which makes Blender really, 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 really strong, that you have the opportunity to create and do whatever you like. Um, there are other interpretations for this, but for this talk, I'll mostly stick to, to these. So let's, let's go. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Sasha Goedegebure. Um, I'm currently based in Singapore. I'm from the Netherlands, but I have been in Singapore since uh, 2008. I am currently a writer, director, showrunner at Omen Studios. Um, Omen Studios is a local studio in Singapore which creates a short film uh, it creates a series, uh, mostly for preschool. Recently, we are trying to branch out to different kind of content. I have been a Blender user since 2004, so been using it a while. Um, Blender means a lot to me. Like, when it comes to um, the list of important things in my life, there are people, 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 and then Blender is part of that list. Then. Python, I started using since 2020. So obviously I came very late to the game. And if I have one regret is not to you know, start uh, a Python earlier. Uh, regrets, but okay, we move on. I consen consider myself not a very technical person. I always say this, and I think this is really important that if I can do it, anybody can do it. And I think as artists, 3D artists, we tend to think that I cannot do this. We artists, we are bad at money, we are bad at finances, we are bad at code, we are bad at technical stuff. But I think um, we can do a lot more, especially with the passion that I see uh, with many people. Now, I started my 3D uh, career with Big Buck Bunny. This was in 2007 in Amsterdam. And the rest, you see some uh, work that we have created with Omen Studios short films, preschool series, but for today's talk, I would like to uh, talk about a personal project. So something that I do in my own free time, I call it Project Fuzzy, not the official title. Um, last year at the Blender Conference, I had a theater talk, 20 minutes theater talk, where I talked about Project Fuzzy. I talked about the challenges 
uh, the obstacles I talked about, you know, being a one person pipeline. Uh, I talked about the changes that I made, which is sometimes we as artists have a hard time doing, making like some like big, big changes that really change the direction. And I talked about the tools, the pipeline, the add-ons uh, operators that I've created to speed up the workflow. So for this uh, talk, I would like to go a bit deeper into, the, into those. Now, regarding Project Fuzzy, um, from the very beginning, I have decided for simple stylized characters. Simple means less controllers, which means easier animation, just to save time. Um, also, young audience. I have a bit of experience with younger audience, so it's a bit easier. Also, young audience have lower expectations. Maybe when it comes to certain animation quality. Uh, let's keep it real. But then, to add a bit of a technical challenge to it, I, uh, I aim to do hair simulation. Um, having a challenge is nice, is inter interesting, keep you kind of like, you know, uh, uh, paying attention. But also it gives the IP or the show something unique, like a, a unique selling point. And at the same time, simulation, once it's set up properly, the simulation does the work for you. So you kind of just press simulation and you go watch Netflix or do something else. Um, at the same time, I've been looking into multi-camera workflow, which means just one file, put all your cameras there, and then just do animate like a sequence of shots. The only thing that I learned from that, do not force it, right? If you feel, if you think that it is easier to just do it separately, just create a new file and then do your separate other shots in a, uh, separately. Then the last one, EV for fast renders. Uh, cycles is great. I see the previous talk mentioned very fast cycles, stylized uh, rendering, which is definitely feasible. However, for this one, I'm looking at hair rendering and I'm aiming for uh, renders of five, six, seven seconds, depending on the context, yet with having all that hair uh, on a laptop like this. So. Now, the, the previous year, has ha I've had my challenges. We all had our challenges, and everyone has different challenges. My challenge has always been layout and animation. Now, there used to be a time where I looked at developers as being people from a different planet. But now, I look at animators as people from a different planet. It is really hard. Um, I have to say, as a, as a, a director and a... Um, uh, uh, yeah, I already start to forget the word. Uh, as a showrunner, I do direct like a lot of animation, but now that the shoe is on their other foot, I, I really know how hard it can be. So this has been a huge challenge, and instead of doing the layout and animation, I end up doing anything else. Clean up code, think of new operators or functionality that I don't really need. Um, so basically excuses not to do layout and animation. <laughs> I did find a solution. And the solution came in the form of shorts. Now, shorts are getting more and more popular, quick content. Um, we're talking about 10 to 30 seconds of content. Now, the aspect ratio is kind of getting used to, because as a storyteller, you're always used to, you know, that you know, white box or that white screen. So that is a little bit of an adaption. Um, however, with you know, content that's 10 to 30 seconds, you can actually finish something. Now, as you can see, it's very stylized, it's very simple, but it, you know, the idea that you can finish something in one day or two days, and it might not be the best, but it feels very fulfilling that you can actually say, I wrap this up, go to the new project, or it goes to the next, uh, next animation. Um, here's a quick example of that. This one is not using a multi-camera workflow. Um, well, obviously, because shorts, you likely just use one camera. No audio, FYI. A reason why I chose this as an example to show is that it's something that I can finish in one, like say, Sunday afternoon. Um, and then it loops, which is an interesting creative kind of challenge with shorts, where you try to make it loop as much as possible. A few things about a shot like this. Uh, there's a spotlight in the background. This is not volumetrics. It's just a plane, plane with gradients, um, which is mixing like transparency uh, with emission. Now the reason to do this is because the rendering has to be fast. So we're talking about four or five seconds per frame, basically. 
then the, the spotlight on the ground, on the floor, is actually part of one of my add-ons, which is a, uh, like a, a gradient that is casted in the background. And I <coughs> simply changed the location, thus making it look like a spotlight. Not a moving camera, so that makes it quite e uh, it's easy to do. Here's another example, also no audio. I'll just play it. Now, this one I find interesting because this one is a multi-camera shot, a uh, multi-camera scene, I should say. Uh, and this one is actually utilizing a whole bunch of tools, operators, uh, and, and other things that I have created to create this fast pipeline. Uh, then it loops again, so it's just on and on and on. I can just play this and, and just let this do its work. Uh, a few things interesting. You see the black bars, the black bars that are closing down. Originally, I had geometry, but I wanted depth of field, and you know, I should, you know, like that means that these black bars will also be affected by the uh, the depth of field. So what I did was I replaced that with grease pencil planes. Normally, it's very annoying that grease pencil is not affected by the depth of field. In this case, it was actually beneficial. So okay, those were some examples. Um, Coding is a necessity. I started this project in 2020, and the moment I thought of doing it, this is the first thing I say to myself. So I have to code, because knowing all the things that I have to do, uh, l having limited time in my extra time that I have, and knowing the steps that are required for different things. And if I would ask you right now, like think of something that you wish there was like an operator or something to automate the process, and I'm sure everyone can think of something, no doubt. Um, so yeah, repeated steps, repeated actions, constantly doing the same thing, especially when you have something like a series with multiple characters where you have to kind of, kind of do the same stuff over and over. So the objectives uh, for the upper operators that I uh, uh, was creating, um, create operators for very mundane tasks, nothing creative about it, um, and then find a place, a location to put these operators and, and some other properties, make this as accessible as possible. So just efficiency, it's all about saving time, basically. So I've created three items, and currently I have a fuzzy populator. Now regarding fuzzy populator, um, this was the reason why I actually started looking into creating uh, operators character and prop management, which is the linking, overwrite libraries, and run character scripts. Now, there, it comes with more things, but it is the linking that was the main reason. As you know, um, in, or if you don't know, before we didn't have the asset browser, so I'm don't, I don't know whether people use, do people use the asset browser for linking characters? So there are some. Because the thing is, once you link in the character, you still have to kind of link in the script separately, and you have to run that. So either way, the time that I started this, um, it was there was no asset browser yet, and you had to instead of overwrite library, it's called create proxy, I believe. So the steps were extremely tedious. The steps were you go to your menu, you go to link, then you go to the folder of your character, then you find the collection, and you link it in and then you have to overwrite library or create proxy, but then you have to link in your scripts and you have to run the script, so it's a very tedious, uh, especially if you have four or five characters. So here's a very quick sample where I open the populator, I link in my characters, and the last button is basically to, um, to run the script and to overwrite the library. And that's it, that's done. I can start animating basically. Now consider doing this in the normal way. I'm still working on the first character, basically. So yes, this was one of the most first things that I wanted to create. Then the other one is fuzzy simulator, which kind of makes sense. So it's the managing of the character hair simulation. It feels very technical, but it is actually the most simple and straightforward one. Um, okay, so here is a quick example. So uh, the title of the panel, kind of obscured by my mouse here, uh, simulator. So at the top, there are a few general operators. Um, these general operators will work on all the characters in the scene. Then below, I can uh, enable or disable the hair simulation. And once I enable it, more and more properties um, 
will be listed that I can quickly access. Now, re regarding play once, for those who don't know, is in Blender, when you play Blender, you will actually cache any animation, or sorry, any simulation that is in your scene, which is actually quite helpful. I do not know about the, the new system of geometry nodes, because I'm still using the old hair system. But when you play once, and you, all you need to do is move the cache to bake, and your simulation is there. The only thing is I needed an operator that really plays once, meaning it plays once, then it pauses or it stops at the end and it doesn't move the cursor uh, back to uh, first frame. So quick example. So here I open or I enabled the hair simulation and different things I can do. I can change the start and the end frame, but in this current example, I'm using the general uh, function to set the start and the end frame. All I'm doing here is set the quality. If there's a lot of motion, I just change the quality to something higher. And after that, I go up, set start and end frame. I play once. After it's played, I press to bake and I set it to external. Uh, as I set it to uh, use external, it will automatically keyframe because it sometimes acts weird when you go back to a file then everything is like reset to the original character uh, settings. So uh, it's fast, it, it works nice. All right, then another one, fuzzy tools. So this was supposed to be just really a minor, a tiny, tiny add-on, but it kind of grew uh, out of proportions, got a little crazy. Uh, don't tell any of the developers, it's 2,000 lines of script. Um, there's no, it's just one, it's just one uh, PI file, by the way. So I know it's not allowed, there's no modules. Um, just to show an example, yeah, it's sometimes, it gets really out of hand. Okay, so uh, this is one panel, which is called Scene Builder, uh, which comes with fuzzy tools. Now in built in parts, I can basically create set up different elements of a scene. And these elements are adjusted to my needs. So now the camera with a very specific naming, very specific clipping, um, there's a floor. Now the floor will, uh, it is a shadow only floor, but with a proper holdout. Um, the sky will set up the entire world nodes. Um, and there is a sun and a rim light, also at very specific settings, like for example, contact sh shadow. I never understood why contact shadow was not enabled by default. And then Optimize EV does a lot of things everywhere. Um, like for example, set the column man management to my likings. So quick example. Oh, so basically what I'm doing here Instead of doing creating these separate elements, I actually have a button that says pop that will do all these things at once. If I ever want to replace certain elements, then I go to the built-in parts. Now, the moment I create this entire uh, scene or set, uh, more panels appear. There's more control for HDRI, uh, for the floor, and for the background. So it's just the whole list. Uh, a, a lot of existing properties that I can quickly access. So I do not have to go into other panels. I do not have to go inside the, uh, the uh, node editor to really speed up the process. Um, after my talk uh, last year, I had a lot of positive responses. So thank you for that. And there was also a bit of interest in fuzzy tools. So with that in mind, yay, it's free on GitHub. It's now available. Yay. yay, yay. Thank you. Thank you. No, stop it. No. Um, so, yeah, uh, I understand that the new Blender now has the extensions platform. I haven't looked into that yet. We'll, uh, that will come soon. For now, you're going to have to put some effort into getting this free add-on uh, on GitHub. It's already at version 3.0. I'm really bad at uh, version numbering. That's for sure. I break a lot of things also in my add-ons. So that's why it's already 3.0. There is a wiki included. So if you ever want to know what everything does, then you can just look for the wiki on that GitHub page. You simply look for Fuzzy Tools Blender and you can easily find this one. Um, there is support for Blender 3.6 up to 4.2. Soon it's going to be 4.3, so it's gonna be a bit challenging, but so far it's working fine. Um, 3.6, I believe, still has one year support. After that, likely have to drop that one. Um, 
So yeah, I uh, would like to give a little demo on the fuzzy tools um, in Blender 4.2. Now, I do not use Blender 4.2 myself because of the jump to uh, Next, EV Next. Now, I understand some people are struggling to kind of adjust their current IP or their work to you know, work nicely in EV Next. EV Next is great, but if you need to kind of match it to an existing style, then it can be a little tricky. So I'm not doing that as for now. But this is 4.2 with fuzzy tools. Now, one thing about fuzzy tools is once you create your set, um, it has a floor that only uh, shows shadows coming from one direction. I understand that Blender 4.3 will have uh, light groups. No, that's not correct. What's it called again? Light linking. light linking, right. So that a light will only affect a specific uh, asset or, or collection, basically. Now, 4.2 and older doesn't have that. So what I've done is, um, and I, because I really needed a rim light without the shadow showing uh, on the floor, I simply utilized a modifier. I believe it's a normal edit modifier where you can basically change the direction of your normals so it will not show the shadows from coming from a specific direction. Now in the example here, I have a rim light and I have a kind of frontal, semi-frontal sunlight. Now you see the shadow coming from the frontal light because of the, this arrow here is facing in the uh, exact opposite direction of the normal of the floor. So if I were to change the position and I also can hide certain shadows. Now, this is a feature that has been in Blender for a long time already. It is a normal edit modifier. It can be used for different purposes. I use it to simply hide shadows come from a certain direction. Especially like my characters, they have like big hair and it's really nice for that light to kind of come through the hair. It kind of makes it look, you know, much, much better. Um, so yeah, won't be needed in 4.3, but for those who are still working on 4.2 and older, so this is kind of like half a solution. Um, now, 4.2 offers some other interesting features and uh, control. It's a bit more complicated because uh, we used to have Amy Declusion in, let's say, EV uh, Legacy. Uh, gets a little trickier now, um, so not sure if people are struggling with EV Next, but you know, if you do, you know, come have a talk. I'd like to know your findings on this one. Um, anyway, there are some settings here that you can use to optimize the look of things. Here I am disabling the normal edit modifier. Uh, then I have a lot of control over the background uh, where I can, for example, have a, a gradient background, whether it's linear or radial. Um, and I can also, you know, hide everything and just render this if I ever want to comp it uh, with something else in the background. So, all right. Sometimes I get something like this. Hey, Sasha, nice add-on, but Right, um, because my add-on is heavily catered to my own needs. So sometimes people might be thinking like, well, it doesn't quite work for me. I have something else in mind. So um, this is where I invite people, just, you know, just make it work for you, change the code. And I think one thing that people are afraid to do, especially artists, is to just go into that code and change it. And for those who want to, but struggling, um, I would like to talk with you. I would like to know what it is that stops you. And I would like to know how I can help with that one. Um, Python as a Blender user or as an artist, I should say, is very scary. So I actually want to talk about something really serious. I know what it feels to be like an artist and you, at some point you've reached your limit. And sometimes depending on what you want to create, you, you cannot go any further. And the other side is always very scary for an artist. So maybe you can already see where this one is going. And I think this is really important, is that sometimes we look at that side and we say, this is not for us. But in order to, you know, in order for you to reach something like a different level, <laughs> I want you guys to really consider this one. And I know I've seen some people, I've seen, I've seen these, and I've always looked up to them. We know that the Blender Studio has several of these guys or, or, or girls, and um, it is not impossible to reach this. Now, the only thing we have to kind of workshop is the name. An artist who can code is not really nice. So 
technical artist, technical director, um, it's too broad. It's funny because there was, a, I met a technical artist earlier, so. Um, this is too broad. A creative coder, not really, because the output from a creative coder is kind of, comes directly from the code itself, so that's different. Pipeline developer, tool developer, nobody wants to put pipeline in their name, and there are some <laughs> people right here. Pipeline artists, I find it very broad and very clumsy how they are put together. So what, do, what did I do? I do what everybody does now is I ask ChatGPT. <laughs> so I ask ChatGPT, give me a name, give me a new name for this. Um, some, of the, some of the suggestions were very silly. I thought this one was quite clever, the Da Vinci. Um, now the rest was rubbish. Just like ChatGPT output is always like, you know, majority is rubbish. But there was one that I really liked. And I'm going to take a sit now to anticipation. Co-doctor. I saw it. I loved it. So I am, hello, I am Sasha. I am a co-doctor <laughs> since 2020. I feel this treats it as this, this, this mix of uh, uh, skills with some respect and I really enjoy that one. So don't know, don't know about you, but I'm, I'm a co-doctor. I would say be a co-doctor. Don't be afraid of this one. Oh, this is also a co-doctor. Um, I'm perfectly fine with that one. I feel being a coder like this, there's different levels of skills, right? I feel I have established or I have uh, uh, accomplished, sorry, I have accomplished a lot by just using Python and code. And um, all I want this to say to people is, to artists specifically, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. You think it's hard, but I think it's gonna be hard if you do not cross that bridge, so. Um, so it's always the question, how do you start with Python? Now, uh, you open Blender, the first thing you must do is enable these two settings. There's developer extras and Python tooltips. So tooltips, there's more information like file paths in the tooltip. And just slowly adapt to the language. Then developer extras give you some options and it allows you to basically kind of open the script. Um, then the Python, Templates in the text editor. Okay, Blender comes with a bunch of templates. So if you open the text editor, you can actually go to templates and you can kind of kind of have a quick read and maybe copy snippets out of it. Um, another thing that has really made a change, and I wish they came earlier, which is something like ChatGPT. ChatGPT can really teach you how to use Python. Um, they can explain everything really nice. Are they always correct? No, they're not. But it's definitely you can level up. Uh, really, really fast. Uh, another thing I like to do is I look at code from existing add-ons. So now let me try this one. I see. Let's see if this works. Okay. So if I have, for example, uh, like this is my own, like this button here, and I would right-click and then you go edit source. You only get this when you have the uh, developers extras enabled. So let's say if I go to scripting, you know what? Let's know. Let's do it from here. So I right-click. I edit source, then in the scripting, you cannot see it here, but I should be able to find the script right here. And I can just change it, mess it up, make sure you have a backup in case it goes wrong. And just look at these things. It's not gonna bite you, so, and it's actually quite fun at some point. Um, this is not my, I think it's, where are you? Where are the, oh. Okay, there we are. Um, I think the best advice that I would, I think uh, that I can give is if you want to learn Python, don't worry about learning Python. Just learn the tools that you need. Think of an operator, think about a functionality that you want to have. Just start writing it. Then you will look in all the directions, whether it's ChatGPT or elsewhere uh, on the internet to find your, the solutions and it's gonna be there. It's gonna come there. So something else, does this ever happen to you? Your animation finished rendering and you find out that the output resolution wasn't 100%. Recognizable, anybody? How about this? It was rendered as a movie file instead of image sequences. Yeah, I'm gonna keep my hand up. It was rendered as an image sequence instead of a movie file. 
Or how about this one? You forgot where to save a specific file. How about this one? You forgot where a specific file is saved. <laughs> how about this? You forgot the naming convention that probably you thought of yourself. Okay, this is happening a lot to me, and maybe it's an aging issue. Well, I think what's more important is that... Um, Where lost it? Oh, it's here. What I, what's most important is these are human mistakes. Uh, whether I have a memory issue or not, it's a human mistake. So you want to uh, have your, I don't know, like Python or tools that help you not worry about those human mistakes. These human mistakes are going to happen. So what I did is I added a new uh, member to the Fuzzy family. Uh, it's called Fuzzy Files, and it simply helps me with the uh, file folder and output management for all my animation and editing. Um, so let's look at some folder structure. Yay! Um, uh, disclaimer, I'm not here to advise on folder structure or naming. I just want to show you what I'm using and to, uh, to show you what the fuzzy files add-on has to work with. So, and this is only for the animation and editing files. There are some other folders, props, etc., characters that I'm not uh, showing here. So I have in the production, I have animation folder, then I have an, uh, on the post-production I have an edit uh, folder, and then I have the output folder. Now, all these three folders will have category folders. Uh, whether they make sense or not, doesn't matter. I can you know, take them out, I can add new category, category to it. So, um, animation has uh, six categories, and I believe the post-production only has uh, five, or, or the other way around. Uh, five in animation and then six in, in uh, post-production side. So inside both the animation and in the output, I create folders where each project goes. Very straightforward, give it a title, give it a number just to keep it in order. Now in the animation uh, side, the, uh, the, the blend files go to the, um, the, the title folder and all the cache that's coming from the hair simulation is going uh, in that same folder. Now. Similarly, for the output, there are folders for the different sequences and then where all the PNG files go. Now, for some reason, I don't know why, it doesn't make sense, I'm not here to advise on this, um, the edit files, they go straight into the category. So that means that the naming has to be a little bit more detailed so things are easy to find and stay in order. Um, then I also have an output for my movies, which I also put together and where all the, just the movie output files go. All right. Um, there are three key identifiers that my add-on needs to work with. So one is file type. By file type, I mean either animation or editing. Since there's only two file types, I only put the, the edits into the edit file name. The animation files don't need this because there's, it's the only, the only file type that is available. Then the other one is category. As you can see, category is written everywhere. I figured because I'm going to write this tool, I don't have to type things myself. I allow the add-on to do the writing, so it's okay if the titles are going to be super long. Uh, then is the title of the project itself. Now, the projects, they cannot be the same name in one category. So if, let's say, one category I have, let's say, skateboarding as title, I cannot use that one in the same category. I would have to call it skateboarding too. But I am allowed to use that title in another category. So I have a, uh, a short called or an animation called skateboarding in the music category, but in skateboarding inside, let's say, the, the story uh, category. Then there's also these numbers. These numbers, uh, they are just to keep things in place, but the add-on has to work with it as well. So here's a quick example. Actually, I think I can show it here. Let me find this one. Let me start. Uh, is it big enough? Is that clear? Yeah? Unless it may be just a little, maybe a little bigger. Let's try that one. Shoop. Right. So when I start a new animation file, um, types are already set to category. Then, uh, sorry, to the types already set to animation, and I have all my categories here. So a few things will happen when I change the category. Now, for example, if I uh, uh, choose compilation, it's going to automatically go to edit because animation 
doesn't need compilation. Compilation means I have take existing sequences and I compile them together. Uh, in this case, I want to do a short, and what it does is it automatically changes it to portrait. So I can change it back to landscape. It's just highlighted as red. Kind of gives me a warning, like, hey, are you sure you want to do landscape short? Doesn't make quite sense, right? Uh, maybe you're wondering what would it look like if, let's say, this was square. That means we have square. So pressing that one is not going to change much. Let's set this one back. All right, set it to landscape. Then I want to create a new short. So I want to call it heavy barbell. New save. File name already exists. Okay, so it warns me if, an exist, uh, if this title already exists in this category. Now I could potentially open it, so you could potentially, instead of having to go through your folders, I just you know, type in the title and I can open it from here. I'm not gonna do that now. Um, so in this case, maybe I'll just call it heavy barbells. Then I go to new save. Then it says, hey, you're supposed to have a folder for this one. So what I do, I have this little button here, this little notification at the bottom, folder created. Now I have a new save. And it tells me now with this information here that it is saved. Uh, if I press new save again, it says file already exists because that this is a new save. So next time I want to save a file, I can simply just use the, the normal way. Um, I have a little, uh, little question mark here. If I ever start to mess up, like the title, any of the categories, I have this little arrow, sorry, this little question mark, which will, which will reset everything, which is gonna look at the code, and it's gonna make sure that everything is correct again. Now, if I'm done with my, let's say, uh, uh, with my animation, then I will go to the output, and I have a little auto icon here. It's gonna automatically set the output. Because one thing is also really problematic. What is the output? Where should it go? What is the naming convention? So it is all automated. Then I have different things to look at. Now this is a animation file, so that's why I have an optimized button here. It's gonna change a few things. Um, here, I can get some warnings like, hey, your composite nodes are not enabled or your denoise nodes uh, are missing. So in that case, I would have to do certain things before I actually press render. Now in this case, let's see if it works. I just go to composite nodes, denoise node missing. Uh, interesting, I don't know why. All right, I'm not gonna bother about it now. Uh, and I simply press uh, render animation and it goes to the right folder. So let's try this. Right, this one I already demonstrated. Uh, let me try the next one. Uh, take this also. All right, this is when, let's say, um, oh, this is also, this is the saving of the file. So I can skip this one as well. All right, then we go to editing. So. If I start video editing here, it's already set to the correct uh, type. Just need to find a short, but I do not know the title anymore. I've got the title of my project. So now if I forgot my title, I have a little auto icon here and it's gonna toggle, it's gonna give me suggestions for the name of the project. So in this case, Seesaw, some other titles. And what does it do? It looks at the sequences that are rendered and it looks whether an existing edit file exists. So once it gets the name that I like, not pickle party, that's for sure. Okay, it was funnier, Bob. So that's the one. And I'm gonna save that one. And the image sequence uh, can be imported. And because it has, it looks at the type and it looks at the category uh, and it looks at the title. So it knows exactly where my sequences are. And this saves a lot of time, right? So once the editing is done, I just optimize my output uh, again, output, it tells me if there already something exists there. Um, then I go into editing, the, I can optimize things, all, whatever setting you want, and I press render, and that's it. So, and it saves, saves a whole lot of time. So let me, all right, if I can, I would like to show a few practical examples. Um, shall we? Right. Camera control. Now, I have a lot of 
cameras in some of these multi-camera setups. And uh, it also means I needed like easier access. One thing that I always found problematic is the selection of cameras and then going to the, the camera uh, menu, uh, which I try not to do as much as possible. So here you can see an example with all my ca uh, cameras set up. It's very messy. However, um, I've added a way to hide all my cameras. And even with the cameras hidden, I can still select the active camera or any other camera. So it allows me still to have access to any properties I can change. However, the active camera is not dependent on selection. So you could potentially select anything you want and then still access like different properties uh, for your active camera, which is really fast, which is really helpful. Um, okay, animate prop visibility. Now, this is one of the few uh, where every time I explain it, I confuse myself, so bear with me. Um, animating visibility is a little tricky in Blender, so not sure if you know, like animating a object is quite okay. You keyframe the, uh, uh, the, the, the viewport visibility, it's the little screen icon, and you keyframe the, 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 the render or the camera icon, uh, which is quite okay. Collections, however, it's not really possible. There are turn, uh, workarounds, like for example, you create an instance of your collection, and then you animate it like you do with any object, basically. But it does mean you have to create an instance of it. So here, uh, I have created a method where, uh, actually I've created two methods. This is the first one. This is for props specifically. So here you can see a props folder and like barbell plus, black bars plus. Now, what does the plus mean? It means that it was a collection, but I converted it uh, uh, to an instance and then it's much easier to animate. So here uh, I have a collection, which is called weights pile and it's still a collection so I can't really animate it. but I click on it and it'll automatically um, automatically create an instance of it it and it puts it in the props folder and the actual collection goes to a hidden uh, goes to a hidden folder somewhere if I ever need it I can take it from there now what's the nice thing is about the uh, the keyframing it'll automatically keyframe the viewport visibility and the render vis visibility, which I'm demonstrating right here. Keyframe visible, and then hide it, and then keyframe it. So again, this is both for viewport and for rendering. Um, yeah, move keyframes and markers. This is quite an extreme one. I sometimes finish my shorts and I show it to my wife. And the first thing she says, too slow. Okay, which means I need I needed having all these uh, uh, markers, having all these keyframes, I need a way to kind of change the timing at a very late stage. It's not something you want to do, but I'm doing it anyway. So I've created an operator, which is part of Fuzzy Tools, basically. Um, let's see, all right, I created this one. I know there are ways to move keyframes and markers, but this one is a bit more mm, aggressive. So you want to be careful when you use it. So it's going to move all the frames uh, on one side of your uh, current frame. It also moves markers. Then you have some settings whether you want to include fake users for animation or not. Now, it says below, target is regardless of selection or visibility. It will respect channels that are locked, but if not, it's going to move it. So even you might have a whole bunch of keyframe stuff, uh, it's going to move it, even though it might be not visible in your scene. Now, the reason I do this, because sometimes I just need to tweak that, that timing at a very last stage. And this one allows me to still do that one. It's very dangerous. Don't do it with heavy scenes. All right, for the next one, I think I have still have a few time. Um, I'm just gonna play this one. I'll try again. I didn't want it. Let's try again. Let's try again. It's 
just for preschool. And then it loops again. I will, you want to hear it again? No, it's okay. <laughs> um, one thing, completely underestimated how tough this actually is. So I'm hoping to get like a library of poses out soon that's going to speed things up a little bit. But if there are certain things that need to be animated, then it's something like this. Anyway, I showed it because some of the things that I want to show um, is kind of, kind of an example of how I utilize it there. Um, first one is the auto naming of the view, la view layers. Now, mo most of the people who use um, uh, view layers is to render the different layers and then composite it together. I'm using it for something else. I actually use it to uh, determine the visibility of my characters. So this is the second thing that I've thought of to uh, handle visibility. It's kind of weird. Now, this is the simple part, by the way. This is just a, sort of a prelude to uh, the actual thing. Now, in this case, I have a few layer, few layer uh, with two characters, Bobby and Bob. Now, I have a, an icon, a button. Sorry, I have a button somewhere. If I click it, it will change the name to Bob and Bobby of the few layer. Now, I'm going to add a new view layer, and that's called underscore 001. I change the Bobby's visibility, and I press that, and the name of the view layer is the name of the visible characters. So wouldn't work with 20 characters, obviously, but with four, five, six characters, really nice, especially if they, uh, if they have short names. So every time I add a character, set the, uh, the visibility, and I click on that button, then my naming is automated. All right, then it comes to the next one, which this is the tricky one. So I'm animating the view layer visibility, which means I'm animating the character visibility. Um, Let's try this. You know what? Maybe I should just do it here so I have a bit more control. Uh, okay. All right. So, okay. What do I have here? I have here um, my different view layers. Now, if I click on them, I basically make them active, the active view layer. Um, however, when I render them, that is really dependent on another thing. Let me open this one. So perhaps you know that few layers have a, um, a property that says render this or don't render this. And this can be keyframed. Uh, this one does not. There is a render single layer, but you cannot do that because you can keyframe it because otherwise you might be keyframing like two layers. So like that means it doesn't work anymore. So what I've do done is I've created um, I created an operator that will keyframe one to be rendered and the other ones will not be rendered. So for example, if I go here, uh, this one is showing four characters, but I want to only show, let's say, B and Bobby. So I select this, make this the active view layer, and I click here, then only that layer will be rendered and the other ones will not be rendered. Now when I scrub in the timeline, it's not going to show it, which is fine, actually, because I can choose to not show it or not. Now, if I press, however, this little, uh, this little uh, car auto icon, it will show me the one layer, view layer, that is going to be rendered. So what I'm doing is I'm changing, um, I'm changing the active view layer. I think this might be a little memory consuming because you're basically each time loading different workspaces, but it's very fun, that's for sure. So as you can see, characters are appearing and disappearing. Um, I don't really need it, so I can disable this, and I can just do my work, and I just basically show any view layer that I want. Then, then it comes to the last one. So here, I'm demonstrating this one. I'm, I can skip this. And I can end with a very simple one, which is build the compositing nodes. I do like compositing, enjoy it a lot, but it takes time. And I think sometimes it's a very mundane, simple task. So I, I add a little button, compositing nodes, where it looks at all the available view layers and is going to basically put them all there, uh, combine them with a big mix node. You can, I can use a mix node because it's just going to always render one of them. And that one will be shown as the final output. So. So that's actually it. Um, 
I have a question, and this is for people that are here. I, for people that are watching, I would like to know, like, what are your interests and, and your questions, whether it's about coding, whether it's about uh, hair, whether it's about anything else. Um, I am looking at creating content for, let's say, preschool, but I'm also interested in what people want to learn for, you know, whatever that I'm showing. So come talk with me. Um, I can always demo, we can always chat, and uh, for people watching, just, you know, write me an email, and I would love to help with that one. So I'm not sure if there's still time for Q&A. Yeah, I think so. Maybe if somebody has some questions. Thank you.